Well, one of the most successful teams on the Michigan State University campus has nothing to do with athletics. It's our perennial national power debate team, and we're going to talk about that and meet some of the team today, the coach and the director, too. Carly Watson is the director of the debate team. Will Repko is the coach, and we've got two of our students, Joanna Gusis and Meow Meow. Uh, welcome to you all. It's it's great to talk about our perennial national power uh, debate team. So uh, why don't we start with you, Carly? Sort of describe your role as director. Yeah, so I work with the staff that are our coaching staff and, um, you know, try to set the team up for competitive success. I am responsible for some of our alumni relations and I also work uh, on the logistics side of things. So we have a group of people that travel all over the country to debate tournaments. And so sometimes my job is part-time travel agent. Uh, <laughs> Um, and then supporting the team competitively as Great. well. And Will, it might be obvious, but as coach, what's your role? Well, the way that uh, a structured college debate works is that you're given a topic in advance, but one of the neat and I think healthy things is you don't know what side of the issue that you'll be on. Often it's determined by the flip of a coin, literally. So my job is to help research and prepare both sides of that question and work with students like Meow Meow and Joanna, and begin to map out what we would do if we were on one side of the debate topic or if we're on the other side of the debate topic. Beyond that, you know, we practice our arguments and we prepare in advance and, you know, we hope for the best. And Joanna, pull that microphone close to you and tell us a little bit about where you're from and what attracted you to debate. How long have you been doing it? Yeah, uh, I'm from the suburbs of Chicago, a town called Northbrook, Illinois. Um, I started debate my freshman year of high school, first day of class. Um, the high school I went to, Glenbrook North, happened to be a very prominent debate school with historical success, great support from, we had a lot of coaches like MSU, thankfully, um, great support from the district, and I started debating and absolutely fell in love with it almost immediately. Um, over the course of those four years, I went to you know, tournaments approximately every month, went to summer camp for seven weeks in between school to keep my research skills up and keep practicing. Um, I was lucky enough to end my high school career with an Illinois State Championship, and then I came to MSU, and it's it's been, you know, as amazing ever since. And is it something growing up, did you really even know what debate was? Like, how old were you when you sort of knew there was an organized way to, to, to debate? Yeah, it sort of, it mostly started in middle school. My okay. brother happened to have, who's a couple years older than I am, happened to have a couple friends on the debate team, knew the debate coach, and they sort of would come to the house and sometimes mention it. It sounded interesting. The thing I thought they were talking about ended up being nothing like what the activity is, which maybe we'll talk about in a little bit. But yeah, I was sort of introduced to it little by little from older friends and then tried it out and absolutely loved it. Cool. And Meow Meow, tell us you've come a long way. Just tell us where you're from a little bit and what debate means to you. Yeah, um, so I'm from China. I debated one year of public forum debate, which is another format of debate during high school. And yeah, um, my but both my coaches are like policy debaters when they were in college, so they kind of set me up for this. Uh, but yeah, this is my uh, second year doing policy debate. Um, when I was in high school, I was the first to achieve seven champions in one season. Um, Sweet. First in that circuit, and I also advanced into the eliminations of TOC and Nats in the U.S. circuit, too. So yeah, I kind of debated both. Cool. Yeah. And I guess, Will, you started to describe it, but tell us sort of how a debate competition works. Does somebody win or just how does one play out? Right. I, I was uh, watching the movie Old School the other day, and there's this fantastic scene with James Carville where he just gives up because the other side's argument is, is too strong. That's not quite how it works when we go and we debate another university. So there's a series of speeches and you don't interrupt one another during the middle of the speech. So even if Joanna is really frustrated or Meow Meow can't believe what the other team is saying, you wait your turn, and eventually there's eight total speeches, and a third-party judge from another university or from the public reviews the debate and, and renders a decision. And usually the debates are decided by a combination of whose research is more advanced on a question of public policy or who is more persuasive in diagnosing the strengths and weaknesses of the opponent's arguments. And so what, what are some of the skills that someone makes someone a good debater? Well, research is a huge part of it. I think when we talk about 
we debate on a topic all season long, so you really have the opportunity to get extremely in-depth into what you're talking about. For a long time, there was this anecdote going around that a student on the debate team does the equivalent of a, of a master's in research in a single year on a given topic. And I honestly would believe it. Our students work incredibly hard to research. They're in the office, the equivalent of a part-time, sometimes full-time job, researching and learning about the topic and, and researching really in-depth questions because you have to go back and forth over the course of the year about a topic. And so I would say research both is a huge part of what you're doing while you're doing it and a huge part of what you can take from it. So yeah, being prepared is as as important as actually making your arguments, I guess, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Middle power activism outweighs and turns to dissent. Not only middle powers will feel emboldened to pursue regional ambitions, that risk conflict between regional powers in every hotspot across the globe of the Middle East, East Asia, and the Caucasus region are primed to escalate absent alignment with the U.S. Middle power alignment is a terminal impact filter which dampens the risk of the dissent because aligning the U.S. with middle powers decreases the propensity for escalation because middle powers pressure states to de escalate regional disputes and, dis- and restrain great powers from ever getting drawn into a conflict that sludges and Sokolsky missile pearl of escalates independently, attacks on critical infrastructure and regional conflicts, acts as all other reasons why addressing great powers are evidence sites Hezbollah and Iranian desires to acquire which are the power Powers that we get involved as with the Twitter explanation, their defense is not up high on advantage one, it just has dual missiles, dual use missiles are stabilizing, but not that middle powers acquiring those missiles is stabilizing. It does not assume or internally use the conflict, even if the missiles in the abstract are stabilizing once countries have them. The- so Joanna, we just heard you at a competition. Tell us what you were doing there and why you were talking so fast. Yeah, so that was this past weekend at a competition. That was the final speech in the debate. So the teams go back and forth the on sides, um, and that was the last speech, and I was trying to persuade the judge that the case that we had presented should be prioritized over the case that the other team had presented. The reason I was going so fast is because one part that Coach Repco left out is that speeches are timed, and over the course of how debates evolved, given we have pretty strict time restrictions, people have decided to start talking pretty fast to get as much as they can in. Um, And so one really cool element about debate, other than the research that Carly talked about, is the speed of info processing. So not only do I need to be able to sort of, in my head, produce thoughts and say them out loud at a speed that you just heard. But the other team does the same thing. And so I need to be able to take notes and understand what they're saying um, at a similar speed at what I was just talking. And then all in real time while it's happening, come up with my own argument, um, which is a thing that we call flowing, um, which is when you're writing down your opponent's arguments. And so that's one element that maybe isn't as applicable to the real world as the literally talking so fast. Um, But I've certainly found it helpful in classes. Sometimes you have professors that talk rather fast and it's helpful to be able to take down their notes but it's also helpful to just be able to process information at speeds um at speeds that are that quick and i've found it helpful when trying to quickly read over homework or just skim an article to be able to understand information quickly yeah i would also um agree with what joanna has said like the speed is really a big thing for me because like english is my second language so like you never know yeah it took some time for me to adapt to that um the volume argument being presented for me was also like so augmented comparing to when I was debating a uh, public forum because the speech times are like twice as long and then people like are really talking fast. So yeah, it took me a while to adapt, but I also find it really useful because like in daily life, when you, for example, are in a class where you're having a conversation with people, when you're going to be able to extrapolate information from uh, what you're engaged in, I feel like everything is kind of like in slow motion and then you can just pretty easily do that. Yeah. And, you know, Will, we've, MSU's been so good at debate for so long. How did that sort of start out, and how do we maintain this so well? Well, for many, many moons, there was a debate program, and then it faded, and then it popped back up again in the 50s, and then it faded again. And by the time it had reemerged for a third time in the 1990s, a, a group of professors on the campus sort of went to the admin and said, what can we do? to institutionalize this. And eventually there was a commitment that stemmed from the fact that our students in these clubs were doing very well. And we formalized the team, gave it a home in the Honors College, which I think is a a good home for a debate program. And it's that stability and support that has allowed students to come from China, to come from Illinois and say, hey, I know that there will be a debate program here over the course of four years, and that's instrumental if they want to have that be part of their undergraduate experience. That rings a bell. Was that President McPherson who did that back in the day? McPherson was involved, uh, but I would actually say that all of the presidents that we've had have 
detected that there was a value to this that went above and beyond winning a competition or getting a trophy. Many of them have had a little bit of background in the activity themselves, and I think they have considered it an introduction to public speaking, to public policy, to research. It checks a lot of boxes. And uh, Joanna and Meow Meow, did you, was, was the debate team part of why you chose MSU? Were you well aware this was a place to go for that? Yeah, absolutely. The debate team was huge in my decision. Um, I basically, when applying to colleges, only applied to schools that I knew had debate programs. It was something that I devoted, like Carly said, probably a master's thesis or two um, worth of work in high school. And it's something that I wasn't willing to give up when I came to college. Um, and MSU, in addition to having a spectacular program for my major, the Honors College, which I'm a part of and was very important in my decision to come here, a big part was the debate team, not only because I'd heard stories about um, how lovely the debate office was as a home base essentially we spend hours and hours there not only doing debate work but also homework and maybe hanging out playing games etc um and i knew that the coaching staff was obviously phenomenal i don't need to say much about that but it's yeah it was absolutely huge in my decision and i'm so thankful because I've, it's proven me a huge part of the way that of the reason that i'm enjoying being at msu so much and meow meow same thing yeah pretty much the same for me because i also pretty much only applied to uh, debate universities. And I feel like, you know, having a space on campus, like when I was like, you know, in a different country and like this new environment of university that I'm in right now, it just feels like it like, the debate team is really like family for me in that sense. I like, I can always just go to the office. I can always find people there and I'm comfortable and happy when I'm with those people. And what do you think for all of you, really, the skills that now you will take away from debating that will serve you well the rest of your life? Meow, meow, you've got the mic. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. So um, the rest of my life, I feel like it is really enriching in terms of knowledge for me. Um, like I got into, for example, like critical theory, critical literature, um, like we were running a feminist abolition critique argument this semester and I'm taking like a fem class like next semester. So um, yeah, and I think like, you know, cause I'm interested in songwriting and music production. So I feel like what I've learned from debate also contributed to like, for example, some of those um, resources that I can draw upon when I'm writing down lyrics to have them be more meaningful, yeah. It's great input. Yeah, I think debate for me, I'm still a little bit figuring out exactly what I want to do later, which hopefully no one's uh, mad that a sophomore still doesn't know exactly, but I'm no. I'm interested. I, I know I want to do something in the world of law and public policy, but also somehow combine that with the world of data and statistics. Um, and I think that debate has been really cool in figuring that out because I get to research such a wide variety of topics. Um, and in doing so, I get to learn about particular niches or things that I'm interested in. I really enjoyed questions of like particular details of a couple of years ago, we were studying, um, we were debating about 3D printed weapons. And I thought that that was really interesting. And so maybe I don't, you know, devote my life to that, but I certainly found little niches. But I know that there certainly are people who have found their calling in a debate. One member of the MSU debate team debated a year on antitrust policy and now decided he wants to be an antitrust lawyer. And so that's certainly not impossible, but... It's a cool opportunity, and I know that the skills that I develop are going to help me no matter what I go into. I would think it would help you just to see both sides of, of any issue going throughout your life. Yeah, absolutely. There's this misnomer about debate and debate people that we like to argue or that <laughs> we can't agree on anything. And sometimes that's true, like when we're driving to a tournament and trying to pick somewhere for lunch and there are 12 people that want to go 12 different places. But I would say the one of the biggest things that debate – teaches as a practice is being able to hear and understand and appreciate what the other side is saying. Because if you don't understand the other team's arguments, then you can't really ever answer them. And so debate really gives you an appreciation for a lot of things, having two sides, two valid sides, two sides with good arguments. And that's a huge part of, of debate and debate is practice. And, and one of the things that you kind of take from that is just an openness to the idea that there is another side with other you know, valid arguments. Yeah, I think there's this misconception that people, you know, toss at my wife all the time. Oh, you're married to the debate coach, so you must lose every single argument at home or, you know, <laughs> he must talk you into every single bad trade possible in the fantasy football league. But I don't, for one. <laughs> and for another, I think, as Carly suggested, actually, I think debate is is very good at teaching people to listen and to consider a perspective other than their own. 
and that's difficult to find. I'll also say, and, and Meow Meow and Joanna hinted on this, there aren't too many other places in the world where a student, because they kind of want to win, wind up debating antitrust policy, and then a week later, debate feminism, and then a month later, debate about public policy as it relates to health care or space or anything else. And these debate resolutions can, can really touch on anything because it's so co-curricular. And I love it as an entry point for all of these students to dabble a little bit in an area of interest that they might not otherwise encounter. And Will and Carly, you both almost led me into this next question. Are there some other facts about debate you would want to reinforce or some myths to dispel? Well, I said the one is yeah. is huge. I mean, anytime you sit next to somebody on the airplane and you say that you're the debate coach, they always say, I wouldn't want to be your husband. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's universal. But yeah, I think I think another thing that people have as a misconception is when they picture a debate, they picture a presidential debate. They picture people talking over each other, using a bunch of ad homs to try to win their quote unquote argument. Um, they picture basically arguing. And what we're doing is much more academically rigorous and structured in the sense that you have a speaking limit. You can't talk over each other. Other people have mentioned that. And so it really is argument and research focused. And if you stand up and say, you know, we should win because the other team is dumb, that would never win a debate because it hasn't produced an argument in support of a resolution. And so, you know, when people picture a presidential debate, it's really nothing like what we do. We get asked that all the time. Um, and so I think the, the academic rigorous argument testing driven by research is a, is a huge part of what people might not kind of understand when they just look at it. A common misconception is that in every iteration, the students only learn to talk really quickly. I mean, we've provided you that sound clip because it's so unique. But one of the most educationally beneficial things that emerges is to learn and know your audience. And so for every situation where Joanna has a debate judge that really wants to emphasize information processing, there's a different debate judge that needs Joanna to slow it down or to adjust to the situation. And one thing that I'm proud of is the takeaway that our students have to be cognizant of who's listening to them. That translates. You know, not every argument that you make is a winner because you can package it a little bit differently for this prof or that prof or that parent or the other parent. And so knowing your audience and adjusting accordingly is a big part of the game. So do you kind of know who the judges are ahead of time and maybe know their their background and, and want to, uh, to study that a little bit? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So before a debate, you'll get the team that you're debating and the judge like 30 minutes to an hour in advance of when the debate's set to begin. And so in that opportunity, you have not only an opportunity to review the arguments that your opponent has made and sort of see where the debate might end up, but also look at the judge. Something Another reason that I think MSU has had such great success is because we've had such a long-standing program and a lot of the judges in the debate community stick around for many years and so maybe a program that's only been around for a couple of years doesn't know all these people as well as um, you know Carly and Repco might because they have relations with directors of other programs they've seen them judge they've judged alongside them on multiple some debates have multiple people judging the debate together and they'll render like a five-person decision and so that's another reason that we've been able to have so much success is just the ability to tailor our arguments which you can only do if you know who the person judging the debate is like that's very true because i feel like i really benefit a lot from our team's knowledge about the judges because i do not know the circuit at all but um it is really nice to just you know get like get the information about the judge in advance because like on the website where we get our pairings and who the judges are we're going to be able to click inside and see what their paradigms are so one of those things that we do um, in pre-round preparation is that we kind of just figure out what the preferences of this judge is, like, for example, in terms of speed or in terms of the argument that they like. Do they like critical arguments more or are they, like, straight up, like, do technical policy debate in front of me? Yeah. Yeah, I've got a myth I'd like to dispel, which is that the debate starts when the first word is uttered and ends when the judge renders a decision. Mm -hmm. To me, debate has been so, so much more than that. I mean, not only, like Mamiya mentioned, um, as an MSU debate team of family, we spend so much time in the office. I've had the pleasure of going to Repco's house for a team dinner. We spend time together in and outside of the debate space itself, but also, you know, the research. I mean, I've learned so much outside of the particular content of individual debates, and that obviously I'll get to carry with me. And then MSU, because of the institutional 
legacy that the program has has the amazing opportunity to have a great alumni network um, and that's something that not only have I been able to reap the benefits of a little bit so far meeting alumni they also contribute to the team via donations and scholarships which is something that all of us are incredibly thankful for um, but all those things combined you know the friends that I've garnered from the activity I've spent years even during COVID I mean most of my high school debate experience was during the pandemic but I managed to make some of my best friends who some of them I've never met in person but I would consider them to be some of my best friends in the world, we talk on the daily. And all those are things that debate has given me, which I'm sure people who participate in other sport would say the same. But, you know, the debate certainly is much more than talking fast or doing some research. And that's something that I'm really lucky to have. Yeah, so um, where I come from, like, I was mainly exposed to, like, three types of debate. Like, public forum, which I did parliamentary debate and then policy debate so there's this always stereotype that's going on over here because public forum debaters are always just like we have evidence and parliamentary debaters are like all proper and then um policy debaters just talk fast um so that's kind of what i've been hearing and picking up from and i was just like well that's like definitely i want to speak up for policy debate here like no we're not just about speed like the volume arguments the technicalities behind all of those are what makes this activity competitive and fun for me. And yeah, like we are not, okay, it's an overstatement to say that we're not, but we're not just like little nerds discussing about like those niche stuff all the time. Like it's a really, really sweet family. We all care for each other. Carly, some final thoughts? Yeah, I love that the team gives everybody a sense of belonging on campus. It's, I mean, I was a member of the debate team when I was a student. Those are my lifelong friends. I can say that being quite a bit older than Joanna and Meow Meow, um, those are still some of my my best friends and the, the, the relationships that I've carried out of MSU. And I also think that everybody in competitive debate is kind of on a personal journey in addition to the competitive journey. And that's sort of a big part of the process that I derive from it as a student. And it's exciting to kind of watch these really inspiring, smart, funny, nerdy, uh, college kids kind of on their own personal journey as it relates to competitive debate. And and so I just feel very lucky to be a part of that. I think it's a common misconception that there's a lot of entry barriers to get a debate program, a debate class, a debate club started in your local community. So we've talked about some incredibly specialized things, but it doesn't have to be that way. So if you're listening to this podcast and you think that there's a fifth grade class out there that could use a few hours of your time, you know, get, get these students up and having their first experience with public speaking at a young age. Have them debate about something that's of interest to them. What's their favorite dessert? What, what should we have school uniforms? It doesn't matter. Public speaking, starting it at a young age, just did wonders for my confidence, and it doesn't need to follow any rigid format. Just a grandparent that's listening that wants to give a few hours back to the local school district could plant a seed that could make a wondrous change in the confidence and academic interests of young people. I can't describe how often I encounter someone who is a very successful lawyer and says that their entry point was an incredibly humbly beginning, humble beginning in a middle school debate class. And I, I, I do consider it a little bit tragic that the state doesn't have a little bit more of that going on. And I hope that the people that are listening to this could flip a switch and just get more people to, to, to give this game a try. Here, here, Will. Well, and if you wanted to learn more about Michigan State University's debate team and perhaps support them if you're so inclined, debate.msu.edu is the place. And Carly, Meow Meow, Joanna, Will, thanks so much. And, and, and thanks for representing MSU so well always. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm Russ White. This is MSU Today.